I'm going to read a little bit tonight and I'm going to talk about disassociation in trauma and what happens to people that have been through trauma. I'm just looking at my phone right now to see that I can see YouTube so I can see any comments come up, but I think I'm here. Okay, right. So what I'm going to do is that I have this book that I've been reading and I started it a few weeks ago and I'm on page probably 115. It's a 315 page book and it's by a gentleman called Donald Kalshed and it's union um, of work of Jung, Carl Gustav Jung. Um, and in therapy um, to understand the process of childhood trauma and the way to heal it takes a lot of um, psychoeducation and clearly people practice um, to become psychotherapists and you know change people's lives through understanding the psyche and people that have complex PTSD generally do not really know you know many will not whoops sorry just dropped my glasses nobody will know for years um, what is going on with them I'll give you an example for myself up until 2017, and it's not a label, but it's an understanding of what's going on. I had no idea that I had CPTSD, which is not a disorder. What it is, it's a reaction to events of years of abuse, which means that we have things such as arrested development and we have disassociation. And there are many things we have as a result of going through childhood trauma that we don't put two and two together very much through life because we disassociate. And it's when we begin to stop the disassociation that the problems begin to really, you know, rear their head, that we see, you know, the damage that has been done. And because we're able to begin to look at it and view it. And it's only, only in through therapy and um, trauma psychoanalysis and reading that I've been able to overcome the worst of the worst of it. And there are many things that people do to disassociate. We're all human, but we've got different levels of disassociation. Like, you know, for instance, that Facebook can be a way of disassociating. Um, messenger with people can be a way of disassociating, you know, just like zoning out. Um, we can also have alcohol. We can do it with food. We can do it with shopping. We, there are so many ways to disassociate, but we, we, we only know what we're doing we have to look at our own lives to understand our own form of disassociation to begin to heal and um, i used to drink and smoke cigarettes which was a form of disassociation and when i stopped that more feelings came to the surface so i'm going to read this but i did just drop my glasses so i need to pick them up sorry about that and then what i'm going to do is begin to read a bit on from this book which is trauma and the soul. So what we have to understand is that if a child's been traumatized, you know, be it sexually abused, very young age, verbally abused, physically abused, spiritually abused, it means that um, we're in a position that the soul is shattered somewhat. And there's a split, which means that split is that we, we're, not, we don't, we're not fully embodied into our human body, you know, and it takes a long time to heal this stuff. It's taken me from the point of stopping drinking in 2012 and then continuing on to having a bit of a, I say a bit of a breakdown, you know, a complete breakdown. I then began to really look at myself and work on myself. And it's, we're always a work in progress. But as I read this, um, I'll be able to then come back to what, why I'm reading this. So here goes. So Donald Calshed in this book, um, Calshed, he calls dis, dis and embodiment. So dis is what he would say is to do with um, Dante and the divine comedy, which not everybody knows what that is, but it's a piece of writing that quite a huge piece of work that was done by Dante. And um, you can Google who that is, or I'll put a link below if you want to explore who that is. And then I'm going to read this, which really touched me. I read it about 24 hours ago. He says, an important facet of this vignette is the way we simply, we, we, is the way my simple inquiry about where my patient's feelings were experienced in her body. 
opened up her deeper feelings and disassociated self states because the self care system is mostly a mental top down defensive structure effectively toned questions directed to sensations in the body can have the effect of bypassing the controlling demon of mentation and he says dis dis so in dante's um, the divine comedy dis would be it might sound a bit scary but it would be what he referred to as lucifer so it's where we're dragged into the pits of hell and that through the pits of hell we then become whole we become fully healed and this you know it can sound scary but i can honestly say for me it's only when i hit breakdown point in 2016 and i stopped disassociating and fell into my own pit of hell that that i began to heal and it's what we would call or refer to as a breakdown. So he says, dis, allowing the fugitive, vulnerable feelings deep in the body a chance for expression. So here he's saying, so we, we cut off, um, so we don't express ourselves, and that's what disassociation is. So, you know, you feel pain, you stuff your face with a cake, you feel pain, you put a cigarette in, you feel pain, you go on social media, and so forth. He says, because dis is part of the pathological mind object, and because the child in the system is usually a personification of the effect in the body, a psychotherapeutic approach that attends to embodied effect is very helpful in the case such as Diane. So he was talking about one of his patients. Such a body sensitive approach proceeds from the understanding that past trauma and its defenses will be encoded in the present psychological states such as breath, gestures, muscular tension, averted gaze, etc., and not in the higher cortical regions where they could be recovered as explicit memories. So an explicit memory is a memory that we don't know how we remember it. So for instance, we know how to cross the road. That's an explicit, implicit, it's a memory that, implicit memory, sorry, are memories that we don't know how we know, but they're there. So, you know, there's an unconscious imprint in us that we know what we know, but we don't know how we know it. So it goes on, and this happens in childhood. There's many things we know how to eat, we know how to brush our teeth, you know, those things we just know and we don't have to think about them. He goes on to say, um, and not in higher cortical regions where they could be recovered by explicit memories. By seeking to work directly with the more body-based implicit memories, that's what I was trying to say, an implicit memory, we help patients like Diane become more aware of their internal sensations and perceptions. So what we've got is, is that when we um, disassociate, we can go into fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and live our lives out in one or two or three of those as we go through life. Um, and they're called flashbacks. And the other thing we do is that we you know, we're not being, we're not able to function at our highest level because of disassociation created in childhood. And also we have developmental arrest, which means that if we were abused, we weren't, you know, for instance, sexual abuse, a child is not able to say no. They just, um, you know, or a child's violently treated or hurt or even verbally, a child has got no way of telling an adult to stop a child has to just you know go along with whatever the parent or the carer is doing and it creates many many problems it means that we get into adult relationships and we don't know how to say no and such like so I don't want to divert too much but I'm going back to reading this he says among among the many contributors to this new way of working with trauma and he mentions here Bonnie Badenox. 2008, being a brain-wise therapist in which she explores the practical significance with many clinical examples of Daniel Siegel's interpersonal neurobiology. It says the sensor monitor approach to psychotherapy, which provides many useful ways in which body sensitive body sensitive techniques can be incorporated into to the conventional psychoanalysis. And he says in Sharon Stanley's work, which is designed to access traumatic states in the body through a gentle pendulation between states of high anxiety and states 
of homeostatic balance and security. So we'll go through where moments where we feel secure, and then we'll go into moments where we're in, you know, hypervigilance and we bounce in and out of that, you know, we'll be hypervigilant and then we'll be okay, we'll feel safe. And this means that people who've been through abuse are more, you know, they're more hypervigilant and they're sort of more living on the edge. And the chemicals that cascade through our body when we're living on the edge, the cortisol levels can run really high. And it's also something that we get used to. So it means that we become used to being in, high alert all of the time, like something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen. And even years after abuse has stopped, we still continue to live like that. And then we play that out in our relationships. So for instance, we can feel like we're gonna be abandoned. Um, we can become codependent as well because of that. You know, there's a lot of issues caused by childhood trauma. Continuing reading, he says, all these new techniques derive from an understanding of the implicit patterns and attachment relationship that become wired into the invariant models within the unconsciousness of the child. These mental models of what Bowlby, 1969, called Shimas, stay in place below the level of consciousness and influence our perception of the world of relationships. The trauma survivor has a particularly rigid set of these mental models. In his or her brain, strong neural networks have been formed that encode repeated traumatic experiences with a caregiver so that states of shame, for example, become embedded as a trait of shame. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, I did it today. I went to visit my doctor for an update on something and, you know, I... I got a bit tearful for a moment about something and I said sorry to her. So the interesting thing is, is that, you know, there's still, I can see where there's still work to do on myself. Like when you're, you know, you're having to say sorry for your tears, for instance. And clearly as a child, you know, I may have been in that position where, you know, not being nurtured or cared for or not having the proper love that what happens is, is that you are ashamed of your feeling states. So you, you know, I don't know what more to say, but it's just, you know, it's tragic that how much, you know, how much pain is caused through child abuse and it plays out through adult life. And it's only through psychoeducation that we're going to heal this along with therapy and whatever else we need. So going on, he says, normally implicit memory, normally implicit memory evolves through the integrative activity of the brain and especially the hippocampus to encoding in higher cortical centers and hence to explicit memory. This leads further with the aid of less left hemispheric integration to narrative memory, the ability to identify an emotional experience as belonging to the past and to articulate it in words as part of one's own personal story. So when we're able to talk about our personal story, we're able to heal it. So if we've got any toxic shame about speaking up and speaking about, you know, what happened through our abuse, whether it be to a therapist or to a friend, then we're not really going to be able to heal. So for people out there who've not been able to share their early traumas, you know, it the way through it is to go through it and to speak about it. Because when we speak about something, we can begin to reformulate what that meant for us instead of living it out and then being in hypervigilance all of the time. We're, we're able to place it in a place that that is not happening anymore and that we are safe now and we can begin to make new decisions for ourselves. Continuing reading, he says, here, he says, the process is part of the humanitarian of archetypal energies that Winnicott calls personalization. So we have to be able to personalize it of what happened to us. He says, but in traumatized individuals, the psyche's defense, especially disassociation, dis, which is what Dante referred to as, you know, Lucifer. And Lucifer in history would have been like fallen from God, you know, of the light. So that's deep work. That's very, um, a lot to do with mythology as well. He says, so discs do not allow for this higher 
differentiation or integration. So we have to speak about it in order to, you know, get a higher understanding and to be able to integrate it as adults and instead of playing out that childhood memory all of the time or memories. He says, instead, the whole nervous system is flooded with stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, etc., And these block the hippocampus from its normal integrative function. Then he says, bodily sensations and primitive emotional states are left encoded in the right hemisphere and in the implicit memory only without the normal integrative activity that would facilitate its translation into higher cortical registration into left-right hemispheric balance and hence into explicit and later narrative memory. Hence, when implicit memory erupts as a flashback, so you, you know, so what he's saying, which is good to know here, an implicit memory is something from the past that we don't know where it came from, but it's there. It's part of our subconscious. It's deep within us. And those implicit memories that if we can't, you know, they basically send us into flashback. So you could, you know, for instance, if you, you know, had a parent look at you in a particular way of disdain before they sexually abused you or were going to hurt you or hit you, you know, if somebody lifted up their hand, for instance, you might, um, you know, that implicit memory is going to come back and you go into flashback. So I would say that the problem, I will bring into this up, that in spirituality, a lot of um, people go into spirituality to heal, but what they don't understand, and a lot of people, is that implicit memories are really running the show and that trying to release and let go of something before you fully processed it through therapy or through psychoeducation is like a backward way of doing things. And I can vouch for that because I did that myself. I got into you know, spiritual work and spiritual groups pre after stopping drinking and really it just kept the pain going because I was trying to forgive and you know surrender something that had not been fully processed so I need to make it clear for anybody who's doing the spiritual work out there you know do it but make sure that you're doing the other work as well this work of psychoeducation and therapy He goes on to say about bodily sensations and primitive emotional states are left encoded in the right hemisphere. Then he goes on, let me see. He says, hence, when implicit memory erupts as a flashback from the past, it is experienced in the immediacy of the moment, stripped of its context and without the modulating influence of higher cortical integration that gives the child a sense of his or her experience in context as a whole. In addition to flooding the brain with stress hormones and putting its integrative activity out of commission, disassociation, DIS, operates by splitting the child's attention at moments of overwhelming effect so that the child's whole experience is fragmented and compartmentalized. For example, and this really touched me what he says here. He says, for example, a child that is being sexually violated by a family member may concentrate so strongly on a focal image in the visual field, perhaps a pattern on the wallpaper, that a state of auto-hypnosis trance is generated. Bodily pain is no longer in focus, but the pattern is. The sensation and or meaning of the violation falls into the background, into implicit memory. This thus in trauma, the fragments of experience are laid down in implicit memory only, remaining unindifferentiated. They also accrue archaic and typical archetypal enhancements. They are amplified to the collective patterns that organize the deeper layer of the psyche and hence they become all the more powerful operating totally out of awareness. This is very deep work I'm reading here, I have to say. Um, The other books that I've been reading are um, Pete Walker's Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving. But I've, you know, I read many, many books and Carl Gustav Jung and other stuff. And I've read very deeply on this, you know, understanding of what trauma is. And I've been doing it to heal myself. And as that, I'm passing out this information on, which I know is helpful to people out there. He says... 
These neurobiological implications help us to understand why purely verbal interpretive methods often do not reach the implicit memories of early trauma, all encoded in the right hemisphere, out of reach of rational words. So the right brain is our, um, you know, let's say that's our imagination, it's the way we create, it's our creativity, and the left brain are the way we form, you know, the way we speak, or the way we get our numbers and our, you know, the way we'll work out how we're going to form words or say something. So it means that, you know, the right but babies, and I think he says this in here, you know, babies, um, they're all right brain, you know, they've got to imagine how are they going to, you know, get their milk. It's like that, you know, they'll, they'll cry automatically. It's like they know what to do. And, you know, we're so vulnerable when we're babies because we, you know, we've got no power. And if we're continuously abused, you know, from the early ages, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever, it really messes with a person's head. And there are so many adults walking around unhealed because that, you know, we just don't know what to do. And or we'll go to the doctor and say we've got anxiety and we're not looking at the deeper stuff. Going on, he says here, so out of reach of rational words, they underscore the importance of working more closely with effects in the body during psychotherapy. Also traumatic memories encoded in the right hemisphere and in the body's musculature are more likely to be available with the, in the intimacies of the effective relationship between patient and therapist, therapist as they create and recreate their own narrative history, their own embodied story. So for me, I wasn't that into therapy at the beginning. I thought, oh my God, you know, it's like, do I want to go there? But when I started doing my own going to trauma psychoanalysis and what I found was, was that a year in, I've been doing it a year now, I started last September. What I've begun to see is the improvement in me is phenomenal. And there are many modalities I did prior to this and spiritual texts and that really didn't touch, you know, didn't go deep enough because being able to be with a therapist and really go back to those hard memories and grieve and cry and healthy anger and healthy blame and have somebody mirror back to you what you're saying. And then also the other thing is, is that we don't realize it's like, where do I feel this in my body? You know, where do I feel this? You know, for instance, I would have a lot of, I would do a lot and I've seen it myself do this on um, YouTube videos as well. I, and I did it, I would touch my neck a lot, you know, I'd always, but far worse, it was my way of protecting myself. It's like when I got, you know, maybe where people get their hands and they get sweaty and they're sort of, you know, how can I explain, like sort of doing this, if you're feeling nervous or whatever, I, this is something I do often, but I do it with feeling safe around here. And I didn't know why I did that, but the more we're able to observe ourselves and have other, somebody who cares about us observing us, we can begin to look at our tendencies. And also then we can begin as we heal, we begin to look at our choices and you know whether we're making healthy choices or not healthy choices. So really what's happening in therapy is that we're learning to reparent ourselves. We're learning to become the adult in ourselves and we're basically, you know, healing. So I've got lost there, but we're basically, we're, we're healing at deep levels through therapy and other things. So let, continue reading this last little bit here. And then I want to show you a few things from Carl Gustav Jung, a few um, quotes. So we have to be able to tell our story because if we can't tell our story, like, you know, my family didn't want to hear my story. And um, I basically feel that many people don't want to hear the story. And I found that in spiritual groups on Facebook, that if I wanted to tell my story, they'd say, let it go, surrender it to God in the highest. And really, you can't do that with childhood trauma. It doesn't really quite work that way. So he says, according to Shaw, and he's talking about the writer here and others, the effects in the body encoded as the implicit memories of early trauma will be more available through the mythopoetic image language of dreams, metaphor and poetry than through the rational interpretive language of insight, left brain. This is the language of the right hemisphere. And we know 
that the right hemisphere is the only hemisphere online in the early months of life. So what he's saying is the right hemisphere is the only part of the brain that is working in the early part of life. So a baby hasn't got the language. It's not using the left brain. It doesn't understand how to add up numbers or how many, you know, how many bottles of milk it can have or, you know, why it can't have an ice cream and stuff like that. It's just, you know, it's all right brain, which is the creative way of creating the creative force. God, I would say so much um, to me, you know, the, the psyche is God to me. It's part of, there is no separation. He goes here, this is the language of the right hemisphere. And we know that the right hemisphere is the only hemisphere online in early months of life. Hence, this is where early trauma is encoded. Such mythopoetic language taps a dynamic or collective stratum of the psyche, one deceptive of those intermediate beings and process described by Diameter to Socrates as halfway between the human and the divine, halfway between the ego and the unconscious, halfway between the left and right hemispheres, halfway between the inner and outer worlds, where one eye looking out, one eye looking out, and one eye looking in, the real truth of stories, all stories resides. He says, as I have emphasized in this book, this intermediate space between mind and body is also uniquely where the human soul seems to live. In trauma work, therefore, we must speak a soulful language because it is uniquely the human soul that is threatened with annihilation by early trauma in a child's life. I will continue to illustrate such mythopoetic attention and reverie in the various clinical vignettes throughout this book. So this is the book I'm reading from, and it's in the link below. What I'm going to show you now is a few Carl Jung quotes to chew on, so to speak, that I found really beautiful and helpful. So this is a stunning book. I just have no words for what this book is doing for me right now. I'm going to read some more later tonight um, on my own. Right, so now what I'm going to do is see if I can share screen and I'm going to see if I can share my screen and let me see here, share. And right, so what I've got here is some quotes. So what I'm going to go for the first one. So what people may know or may not know, um, this is Carl Gustav Jung and he died in 1961 and it's through him that psychotherapy exists as we know it today. Now he worked with Freud and he was 20 years younger than Freud, but they fell out because they had different difference of opinion, which, um, you know, again, this is history. Um, there were other um, psychotherapists of that time as well and psychiatrists, which, um, but this is my favorite which is Carl Gustav Jung. Now, this is a few um, quotes that we can chew on. And whilst I say that, I can't see if anybody comments whilst I'm here. So I'm just gonna tap onto my YouTube from my iPhone. So if anybody does comment, I can see. Let's see here, volume off. Okay, that's my channel. Okay, so now I can see myself. Okay, right, so I've got no comments. So what I'm doing now is I'm just gonna run through a few slides. So this is Carl Gustav Jung, a stunning man. I really feel like a soul connection with him um, in just the work that he's done. It's just, you know, it's been life-changing for me. So this is, I'm just gonna read a few and see if anybody wants to comment as I go. Um, if not, that's fine. He says, the most intense conflicts if overcome, leave behind a sense of security and calm that is not easily disturbed. It is just these intense conflicts and their conflagration which are needed to produce valuable and lasting results. Next one. He says, there is no coming to consciousness without pain. Now. Unfortunately, this is really true. You know, like when I stopped drinking, you know, I became more conscious. Um, I was a late drinker, late starter in, um, you know, using alcohol. I started at 30, um, age 30. And at that time, I 
you know, got heavily then into recreational drugs, which, you know, I think a lot of, I'm not suggesting anybody does that, but, you know, I lived in a part of London where that was happening and there was parties and things. And, you know, it, it was a period I went through for about seven years, but drinking continued after that. And um, that was part of me, you know, having to come to terms with who I was as well. And then this one, he says, as far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being, which I agree with totally. Um, and then what else do we have? I don't know if you can see this, actually. I'm wondering that I'm just going to see if I'm sharing screen properly, because I don't think I am, which is going to make it boring for people. Hang on a minute. What am I doing let me see, share screen. Let's go back to this. So there we go. What am I doing? I'm losing the plot here a bit tonight. Maybe I shouldn't be sharing these because, but I'm gonna be on it in a minute. So let's see this. I've got so many tabs open, you wouldn't believe it. So. Let's see, I think I've lost myself. Okay, so all I can see is, all I can see is that I'm not showing it properly. Hang on a minute, what am I doing? Let me see, share, stop share, and then share, got it. Okay, we're back. Who's that? That's Timmy. Hi, we can only see, yeah, absolutely. I'm back with, I'm back to, I've got it. I was really messing around there. Anyway, right, here I am. So let's go. As far as we can discern the sole purpose of, I hope you can see this now. Let me see. Timmy, if you can tell me, that would be great. But I think you can. Yes. Okay. I can see it. Brilliant. Okay. So as far as we can discern the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. So the whole point there is, is that, you know, if, if I can be kindle a light in the, in the, you know, in others' beings as a result of talking about my own trauma and my own abuse, I don't even want to say my own abuse, the abuse that I experienced in childhood, you know, then it, it, it's, you know, we have the butterfly effect in this world. Um, you know, we're all valuable. Each of our stories counts. So none of us need to hide or have toxic shame about what we've been through. Um, there's a lot of toxic shaming in this world over people who've been sexually abused. One of the big ones is, is why aren't you over it yet? And they're your parents. You need to forgive them or it was, you know, your family. It's really hard for people. So let's go on. He says, I regret many follies which sprang from my obstinacy, if that's right. But without that trait, I would not have reached my goal. So, you know, we just keep going through life um, as we do. And then he says here, a psychoneurosis must be understood ultimately as a suffering of a soul, which has not yet not discovered its meaning, has not discovered its meaning. So we, as we go through life and we heal, we will discover our meaning because coming through from abuse for many of us, you know, we feel that life is meaningless and it can be very unfair and it can be very traumatizing to have your childhood and your soul shattered as a child. And, you know, we need to find our meaning. It's imperative we, you know, rise above where we've come from. And this one, he says, there is no consciousness without discrimination of opposites. So we have to be able to discriminate. So judging what others, this again, let's go away from spirituality um, where people say, you know, that, um, you know, it's but wrong to judge. I mean, that is complete bull. Um, you know, we need to judge and also our ego allows us to make decisions. So that's really important too. Somebody says there, Ronfano says, the purpose of human existence is to persist as love in the most unlikely conditions. Yes, Ronfano, but I would say that that's very difficult for people that have been through, you know, heinous abuse. I understand what you're saying, but I don't like to go too spiritual on people that have been through um, heinous abuse. I clearly don't know your own story. We're all at different levels in understanding, but I'm very wary that people do not get bypassed by through spiritual text and um, being told things where they've not processed. So I understand what you're saying about love, 
Um, but many people that have been through heinous abuse struggle enough to love themselves because they've got a heinous inner critic that was given to them by their parents. I'm sure you understand what I'm saying there um, on that one. So yes, love is a brilliant thing, but we're not to bypass. We need to process the abuse that has happened and have a witness to our abuse so that we can overcome it. And he says here, he says that consciousness and understanding arise from discrimination, that is through analysis, dissolution followed by synthesis, synthesis as stated in the sim symbolical terms by the alchemist dictum. I don't know how to say that, dissolve. Anyway, it says dissolve and cogulate. That's a really good one. Um, next slide. I made these memes myself, um, but clearly they're not my words. And this one really touches my soul. It says, because, you know, I feel that I'm quite individuated, meaning that I'm a bit of a loner. I feel sometimes I don't fit into the world outside there. I'm sure many of us can um, feel that also. He says, loneliness does not come from having no people about one, but from being unable to communicate the things that seem important to oneself or from holding certain views which others find inadmissible. So sometimes I find that I hold views that are, you know, inadmissible or people don't, you know, really understand them. All. So the best way around that for us is that if people don't understand, you know, what, what we come from, ask them questions rather than just trying to tell people, just ask them questions. And then the loneliness, whether I feel lonely, I think sometimes I need to communicate more. I need to speak to people that get me and it seems few and far between. So I'm glad I've got therapy and also social media helps in groups because we can, you know, speak to people that are of like minds. That's the other thing. What's said there? Let me see. The quote of loneliness is particularly meaningful to me. Also, I quote it often to others and that's Thomas says that. Yes. It's a beautiful one. I love Carl Jung's work. He's really, it's really helped me. And another one, Carl Gustav Jung says, and yet the attainment of consciousness was the most precious fruit of the tree of knowledge, the magical weapon which gave man victory over the earth and which we will, we hope will give him still a greater victory over himself. And I think with regard to consciousness that humanity has a long way to go, you know, we can clearly see there is some evil in the world still. There are still people sexually abusing children. There are rituals being carried out on children. There, you know, there's trafficking. There's all sorts of things. So, you know, we can't spiritual bypass. It's like we have to, we can do all of the being loving, but we have to be, you know, realistic. We have to protect ourselves. We have to protect the ones we love and we have to watch out for people. You know, not everybody is sweet and light and delight. You know, this is the way it is. Let me see here who says, perhaps Bob Dylan wrote, life sometimes must get lonely. <laughs> yes. Well, I think I've been alone for a long time, so I think I've done pretty well. I think I'm ahead of the game in loneliness, but I don't feel so lonely anymore because I keep myself busy. What is MBTI? I don't know, actually. I don't know what you're referring to there. That's one of MBTI. I don't know what you mean there. Then he says, I'm an intuitive introvert as well as one can label oneself. Yeah, I try not to lay, I'm funny with labels. I think language, Gemini sun and Gemini moon, I can label that on myself. But I think that, um, you know, I don't like, I, I'm funny with words, like, you know, even complex PTSD, you know, I'm not labeling, it's it's not, to me, it's not a disorder and it's not a disorder, it's something, it's a response to. And I see people labeling themselves with things that they haven't got. So I'm not a label girl um, personally, but it's okay, we have to do what we do. Myers-Briggs, often used, but yes, yes, I do get you. I think I'm just on my own, I sort of see the bigger pictures. So I think we're souls. So I think how can we label our souls in a body? It's immense, this human being thing. Aha, uh -huh, next one. Um, everyone carries a shadow and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. All 
at all counts, in it forms an unconscious snag, thwarting our most well-meant intentions. So really, I could, I've could i been able to embrace my shadow. Like when I did my healthy angering through my complex PTSD work, when I did my healthy angering, I let loose. I let, I, I blamed and I stamped my feet and I hit my pillows and it was really healing for me. And then I, because I allowed that, the toxic shame fell away and so did all of the guilt, the guilting that's in society. You know, honor thy whoever, whoever. Um, Thomas says, I can't even wear a tag of, at, at a social event such as, my dislike for labels. Yeah, I'm the same. It's like when somebody gives me a name tag with it, with my name on it, it's like, I want to hide it. I don't want to put tags on me. Don't tag me. Okay. Right. Don't tag me on Facebook either. <laughs> tags out. There you go. All right. So next one, knowing your own darkness is the best method for dealing with the darkness of other people. I agree with that one. Love that one. What else? Oh, and this is the last one. This really made, I don't know why this is here. It's a blue one, and it's not the one I made, but it says, Dr. Young never said, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Dr. Young said was, it is not, it is not I who create myself, rather, I happen to myself. And I don't know if there's any more here. And I made this, this is a meme, and I thought the life workshop, our life workshop is individuation. I'm not doing a life, life workshop. It's just a meme that I made. And unconscious snag. It's a really good term. All right, so that's it for today. I'm going to I'm gonna get on with some personal stuff and whatever I'm gonna do. I think that's it. So I'm gonna stop share. Am I back? I don't know. I think I am. So I think life can get really good um, when we begin to do this work. Um, that we can begin to arrive at a place of healing that's, um, you know, beyond anything we thought possible. So I don't know if I've stopped share, actually. Yes, I have. So I, that's, you know, I really believe that, you know, I have my bad days, I have my flashbacks, I have moments of, you know, freaking out and whatever I, else I do. But over, overall, you know, I, I see the beauty in me. I see the growth that come about I see how I'm not you know I'm moving away from codependency I see you know the strides I've made and you know I'm just like just you know somewhere in all of this has been grace so you know I just I really commend um Pete Walker's work to to grow and become you know to get rid of this CPTSD thing or to, to you know integrate it and all, then also this book that I've just been reading tonight and there's so much more out there I'll be back and maybe tomorrow or the day after and I'm going to leave it there for tonight I'm going to end my meeting and I really thank you for watching me and being with me here tonight thanks a lot and if you want to come over to Facebook I've got a ladies group and um, for ladies and then there's um other groups that I know where men can join as well um, on healing complex PTSD and anxiety. Catch you later. Thanks for watching.